the place where we meet God. And whenever an ordinary person runs into God, extraordinary should be the outcome of that. And one of my favorite ways to interact with God and to experience the extraordinary power of God and transformation of God is through studying characters in the Bible. And that's what we're going to do in this series. In general, I love biographies. All right? I love studying the stories of individuals who did great things, especially when they started with meager starts but ended up doing great things. I love sports biographies about the people that I love to cheer for on the TV but see how they really started out. For those who watch NFL Network, I love the football life stories. I love the 30 for 30s. I love those things. I love to read biographies about people from like historical eras, American, not so much uh, the world history, but like I love the revolutionary guys, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, those guys. I find it fascinating and inspiring to see what people who look no different than me and you, but how they can do really great things when they you know, apply themselves in certain ways. And today, we're going to start a study on my favorite category of biography, obviously, is biblical saints and people who do great things for the kingdom of God. And we're going to start by studying a man named Abraham. And Abraham may be the most inspiring guy in the entire world, in the entire Bible, at least in my opinion. And I hope you would share that after you uh, listen to his story a little bit as well. Abraham needs really no introduction. Abraham is the father of all nations. Okay, Christians call him their father. Jews call him their father. Muslim calls him their father. Abraham is father of probably 99% of this world. That's why he even got the song named after him, which is Father Abraham had many sons. We know that song. But did you know that in addition to all of us saying that we are children of Abraham, did you know that even Jesus Christ himself called himself a son of Abraham? It says right here in the very first verse in the New Testament, the very first verse in the gospel says, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, son of David, son of Abraham. That's a good list to be on because Jesus said that God in heaven is my father and I am his son. And the only other two people that he said that he's the son of is David, who's another very inspiring character. We'll leave him for another time. And then about Abraham. Abraham was a giant. Abraham was a man of faith. Abraham was the top of the top, the cream of the crop. None was better than Abraham. But the best part about studying biographies is not hearing a story about how great somebody else is. What makes the story inspirational is how he didn't start that way. What we're going to see with Abraham is Abraham, top of the top. Abraham, man of faith. Abraham, giant of faith. But Abraham didn't start that way. And what we're going to see about Abraham, the inspirational part is when we see that, you know what? We got flaws. He had flaws. We get weak. He had weak. And the best thing about the scriptures, the scriptures don't sugarcoat the stories of its heroes. Like the Bible doesn't hide the fact that David was an adulterer. It actually highlights it. Doesn't hide the fact that Moses, the Red Sea Moses, like manna from heaven Moses, like water from a rock, he was a murderer. The Bible doesn't hide the fact that Noah, the guy who God said that he's the best of all the people on this planet, and I'm going to get rid of everyone and keep him. But Noah one night had a little bit too much to drinky drinky, and Noah ended up losing his clothes in front of his kids and indecent exposure. If that was a thing back then, he would have got arrested for that. The Bible doesn't hide those facts. And even though I'm not planning to do any of those things, and neither should you, I find it inspiring that those who committed those crimes and made those mistakes were still able to be great and be useful in the kingdom of God. God doesn't use extraordinary people. God uses ordinary people, and then he gives them that little extra that they need to be extraordinary. That's a good one, isn't it? God doesn't use extraordinary. He uses ordinary, but he gives them that little, come on, I'm trying here. I'm trying. That's a good one. Give them that little extra. Okay, that's fine. Pathetic. Miserable people. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Someone appreciates this. Okay, very good. Because she's sitting next to my wife, so my wife's like laugh at his jokes. Okay. If y'all don't laugh at my jokes, she will hear about it all week. Okay. And she will be hearing me practice for next week. So just laugh. Okay. Abraham. Thank you. <laughs> Abraham is all about faith. And Abraham is first in faith. But when I say first in faith, I mean it in two ways. He's first in faith, first of all, in a like the biggest, and he had the most faith. And Abraham, you know, like I said, we'll see his story and we'll see how Abraham obeyed and trusted in ways that's incomprehensible for us today. But that's not the only first that Abraham was. 
I also mean first in the sense that he was literally the first. Because Abraham, like we look back and say, I wish I had faith like Abraham. But Abraham, who did Abraham look to? Abraham didn't have anybody. Abraham's story appears in Genesis chapter 12. Genesis is the first book of the Bible. And in the beginning, okay, we read about Adam and Eve. Didn't go so well there. Not great role models there. We hear about Cain and Abel. Don't follow their example either. It didn't go well. We hear about Noah, but Noah was like, you know, flood. Like how often is that flood thing going to happen again? That seemed like a kind of a one-off situation. And then we hear about Abraham. And God appears to Abraham and starts telling him to do stuff. And me and you, we look and say, man, the way Abraham did, I want to do. Or the way David did, I want to do. Or the way Moses did, I want to do. But who did Abraham look to? Abraham shows us that it's not necessarily about quantity of faith. It's about faith in the right person. Because even Jesus said that himself, didn't he? He said, all you need for faith is the size of a mustard seed, small amount of faith. But in the right person, small amount of faith can do big things. The writer of the, New Te- of the book of Hebrews in the New Testament says in Hebrews 11, verse eight, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. I like this because it says that by faith, Abraham, and then it says what he did, which is he left his land, which we'll get into that in a little bit. But I want to say that Abraham, you may say in your life, and I may say in my life, I took this step by faith. But I don't think that's really an accurate statement that we took, took it by faith the same way Abraham did. Because for us, it's more like, well, it was faith in God, but it was also kind of logical, like, You know, Father Anthony said, we need to forgive. So by faith, I forgave. Well, it's kind of faith, but it's also kind of experience says that if you forgive, you feel better. Even scientists tell us about all the illnesses that come from holding on to grudges. So it's like faith in God mixed with logic, mixed with experience. Or you may say, you know, by faith, I, you know, married this girl by faith. Okay, but she's clearly better than you anyway. So like how much faith does that really take? You know what I mean? But Abraham really didn't have anything. Abraham didn't have, well, past experience says. Abraham didn't have, well, logic says. Abraham just had one thing, God says. And he went out. That's faith. So Abraham was first in terms of his greatness in faith, but he was also first historically in faith because there was no track record before him. Abraham was the first one to show us what a life of faith is all about. Abraham was the first to show us that a life of 100% surrender to God will lead to 100% blessing from God. Abraham was the first one that knew that the path to greatness in life is taking God at his word. And Abraham was the first one to show us that every syllable that God utters, that if you keep that word, that if you keep what God commands you, if you obey God to the letter, if you obey exactly what God tells you to do, you will never, ever, ever regret that. And he shows us that greatness comes from truly trusting and believing in God. And he's the first one to show us that with God, nothing is impossible. That you may have nothing on your side, nobody in your corner, but if God is there, you got everything that you need to be great. The other thing that Abraham was the first to show us is Abraham was the first to show us a relational side of a God. Abraham was the first one to show us that our goal in life is not to be servants of God. We are servants of God. But God even allows us to be hired, which is sons of God. But you know, there's even something that Abraham took another step. Look what James says in James chapter two, verse 23. Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. That you can be friend of God. And actually there's times in the book of Genesis where God says to Abraham, they have this conversation and God's saying, Abraham, come here. Let me tell you what I'm doing. I'm going to do this in Sodom and Gomorrah. And I don't want to hide from you, Abraham, what I'm doing. God like confides in Abraham, that God, God calls him not just, you're my servant, go over there and do that, that God says, you're my friend. And Abraham shows us what that life looks like. So that's the introduction for Abraham. Abraham's a stud, said another way, first in faith. Let's pick up the story of Abraham. Let's get a little historical context, and then we'll jump into what the scriptures say. We're not going to go very far in the scriptures today. We're going to kind of do an introduction. Next week, we're really going to pick up the action, but let's start here with a map of where Abraham lived at the time we pick up the story. We're roughly in the year 2000 BC, it's Genesis chapter 12. And Abraham lived in a city called Ur, all right? Now Ur is at the bottom right of the screen. You see it there at the bottom right? 
I know I, I, this was the best map. I know it's not English, okay? Like I know it's probably French or Spanish or Italian or whatever it may be. I don't know what it is, but this was the clearest map that I could find. So forgive the, I'm just trying to like, you know, culture, bring culture to this action right here. So see where he is at the bottom in Ur. Ur looks like a good place to live or a bad place to live. Great place to live, why? Two reasons. Number one, it is on a river. And which river is that? Does it say on the map what river that is? That's the Euphrates River. It's a good place to live. B, it is just north of what? The Golfe Paresque, okay? The Persian Gulf, okay? It's just north of the Persian Gulf, which again made Ur a great place to live. Ur was bustling with traffic, people coming and going because it was just close to the Persian Gulf. It was a fertile land because it was right on the river. Ur was a great place to raise your family. Ur was a great place to start a business. Ur was the place to be. Now, eventually, we're going to see God call Abraham to Canaan, which is on the far left of the screen. What do you see between Ur and Canaan? Nothing. Very good, because that's desert. So Abraham, just to get the context, is living in a nice city. Like I said, good place to raise a family, start a business. This is the place you want to settle down. But the problem in this city is idolatry ran rampant, as often is the case some of the most flourishing, successful cities when it comes to the world also would be the worst ones when it comes to morality and ethics. F.B. Meyer, the great biblical historian, writes about this time. He says, the human race seemed verging again on the brink of those horrible and unnatural crimes that had already necess necessitated its almost total destruction in the days of Noah. And it was evident that some means must be quickly adopted to stop the progress of moral defilement and to save mankind. What F.E. Meyer is saying right here is the world was in a bad shape. The last time the world had been this bad, it was the time of Noah. And we all know how that worked out when the time of Noah. God flooded the place because it was so bad. But then there's a problem now. God had said after Noah, I'm not going to do this again. I'm not going to flood the earth again. But there's a problem is that the bad stuff is rising and the bad stuff is coming up and the world is becoming decayed. So what does God do now? What can God do? He already promised, like he kind of made the promise that he's like, man, I, no, I'm not saying that God did that. But I'm saying God already promised that he's not going to flood it again. So what could he do? What does God send now when God wants to fix something that's broken? When God wants to heal the world. Does God send floods? God sends people. Look at this verse from Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30. The people of the land have used oppressions, committed robbery, and mistreated the poor and needy, and they wrongfully oppressed the stranger, saying the world is in a bad shape. So I sought for a man among them. Not a flood, not a tornado. I sought for a man among them who would make a wall. Every Republican just got very happy with this verse. Okay? <laughs> I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy. God doesn't fix the world by floods by earthquakes, by tornadoes. God doesn't fix the world by legislation. God doesn't fix the world by military anymore. God fixes the world by raising up people. And some of them were prophets, as somebody said. And God said, you, I raised you up as a prophet, go fix. And God, some of them were priests. And some of them were judges. And one of them was his own son. Because we know the verse that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son into the world to fix the world, to heal the world. That's how God works today, through people, through saviors. You know, a few minutes ago, Joe was up here and he said, happy International Women's Weekend or something like that. I did not know that was a thing, okay? I don't know if Joe made that up or not, okay? Because I thought like I was like the first, I was gonna tell you guys that last week, um, I was invited to attend a thing in the State Department, okay, honoring the International Women of Courage. Okay, because one of the uh, honorees was someone who's a, a, a friend. And I was there, and I think it was Thursday or Wednesday, whatever day it was. And I saw with my own eyes this verse. Okay, I saw this verse. That there are certain people out there, and these were all honoring women, but it's men and women. Okay, they were honoring women who saw a need and said something's not right. And while me and you lift up our hands and say, God, why don't you send someone? And God's like, I did. And let me tell you about some of the people that God sent. I was able to see uh, a lady. I'm going to mess up all these names. Forgive me. I, they're international names. So forgive me. Olive, Olivera Lack, 
Kick, who is an investigative journalist from Montenegro, who is exposing, who is using her journalism to expose organized crime and corruption in the government. A task, which if you ever lived in a place that is with corruption or organized crime, you know that's a one-way death sentence right there. But she fought. There was Sister Orla Tracy, an Irish nun, who helped start a boarding school, not in her hometown, not in her village, not in her country, not in her neighboring country, but God put on her heart South Sudan. And she started a boarding school over there in South Sudan. This next one, I'm not even trying to pronounce the name. I'll spell it and y'all can figure it out. This is a lady whose first name is N-A-W and last name is P-A-W. And then she got a middle name with lots of apostrophes in between there, okay? And she's from Burma. And what she is doing all by herself and whatever who will join her is trying to expose a military regime which thinks that it's okay to just walk through villages and rape any women that they'd like to. And that's totally fine by the, the government in that village or in that town. And she, being a woman who is exposing herself to incredible danger, is standing up and saying, this isn't right and I will fight it. And that person and that person, that person should be brought to justice. And then of course, the one who I was going to see is Mama Maggie, who many of you know, okay, who is the sister of one of our church members right here. And Mama Maggie is a lady who left a life of affluence and great opportunity and decided to serve the poorest of the poor in the slums, the garbage slums in Egypt. God doesn't send legislation to fix the world. God doesn't send floods. God sends people, and maybe some of those people are here today. Maybe there's some people today, next time you feel a nudge, you know the nudge? Like, like all those ladies that I said right there, if you, if you ask them to tell their story, they'd probably tell you there was a nudge. You know the nudge, because it's a nudge that you tell, be quiet. Tell the nudge to go away, because I got bills and I got commitments. Go away to that nudge. You know it. It comes up and you push it away. And then it comes over here and you go over here. And it goes there and you go over there. And then it comes there and you can't escape. So you're like, somebody needs to do something. Who wants to write a check so somebody can do this? That little nudge? Well, that little nudge may be God's way of solving a problem in the world. Abraham was the first one. Abraham was the first. He was a type of Christ because he was the first one that was sent into the world to heal the world. There's the context of Abraham. Bad world, he's in a flourishing city, but morally is going in a bad place. He's the first of the first. And now God calls Abraham. And you're thinking to yourself, if God were to call me, let's say today, I say God is gonna call you. The world out there is not getting any better. And I say today, you got his hand, his hand upon you today. You're gonna say, yes, how lucky I am, right? Like how great it would be to be chosen by God to be that person right? That's a great thing. It's a good thing, right? To be lucky, to be chosen by God. Everyone's got to look on their face like, uh, you know where this goes. Let's see how lucky Abraham is. Now the Lord said to Abram, Abram is his name. God changed it to Abraham. Don't worry. We'll get to that later. Now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. Lucky, lucky, lucky. Abraham, congratulations. You are chosen by God. God's going to make a great nation out of you. Okay, great. Where's the award? Where's the trophy? Where's the camera? Well, here's the calling to blessing. The calling to blessing, life of faith, begins with separation. That's not what we were expecting. We were expecting God chooses me, so now I get blessing. Like blessing upon blessing upon blessing upon blessing. Like bring the good stuff. No, 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 no. Oh, there's blessing, but it doesn't start with blessing. It starts with separation. Get out of your country, leave your land, leave your family, quit your job, pack up the, the, the you know, kids, pack up whatever it is that you got, the livestock. We talked about Abraham a couple weeks back when we were doing that series on marriage, and I talked about it then, and I was saying, it's, it's hard enough to contemplate, to consider this idea of pack up and move today, like, it's hard enough to, to consider that today with, 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 with you know, TripAdvisor and, and Airbnb and, and, you know, and rate my city or whatever it may be. Like, it's hard enough to consider, like, the stress that would provide today to get up and move. But it's infinitely harder back then. Because back then, there was, no, there was no TripAdvisor. There was no check out the cities, no hotels. Back then, 
you nobody left their land unless they were being chased out of it. Because you couldn't just, okay, you know what? Cash out my bank account and take my cash. You couldn't, all your money, you didn't have cash. Your money was two things. It was your land and it was your livestock. So you couldn't liquidate those in my point. You couldn't just sell it all, take the cash and start over over there. By leaving, he left everything and his livelihood. In addition, he left his family. And you know that Abraham doesn't have any kids right now. It's gonna be a while for him to have kids. So Abraham leaves his family above, leaves his parents, leaves siblings, cousins, whatever, at least that's what he's called to do. We'll see next week how he doesn't necessarily do that. And then he has no children to leave anything to. So he has no one above him, no one below him, no one to the side of him. So who's he got? Who's he got? He's got God. And the call of faith, the call of blessing, begins with separation. We think the call of blessing is God knocks on our door. Good morning, sleepyhead. How are you? You want me to bless you today? Okay, let's bless. No, 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 no. God knocks, and God says, you want me to bless? But the blessing begins with separation. You have to, you want to live? Jesus said, you got to die first. You want to be rich? You have to sell all. You want glory? You must be first willing to carry your cross of shame. It's always the way it is with God. We're going to read a passage right now from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 through 18. And as we read it, I want you to answer this question in your head. How blessable am I by God? Like, how blessable am I? I'm telling you the blessing, okay? Life of faith begins with separation. So we're going to read about the separation that God is looking for. We want blessing. God wants separation. I say, God, make me the most blessed. God says, okay, I will. But what I want from you is to be the most separated. And I, as you read it, and you want God to bless you, ask yourself as we read this, how blessable is your life? 2 Corinthians chapter 6, starting verse 14. Do not be unequally yoked. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial, meaning false God? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, listen, how blessable am I? Therefore, come out from among them and be separate. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. You know, separate. Separate means set apart. And you know what other word means set apart? What word means set apart? Holy. That's what holy means. Holy doesn't mean you have a little halo over your head. Holy means you're not like everybody else. You're set apart. You're different. You're separate from them. And I'm telling you that God wants to bless you. But in order to bless you, you must be separate. God cannot bless in the middle of the junk. And the only way, the only way to receive the fullness of God's blessing for Abraham, Abraham, I got to take you from out of there and I got to put you over here. Why? We'll see why in a little bit, but don't, why doesn't matter? Because it's God. It doesn't really matter. We don't ask him why. He tells us why and that's it. The man who wants to have a beautiful wife, but doesn't want to let go of his old girlfriend. Doesn't work. Be separate is what you would say to this guy. You want the blessing of the girl? Be separate from the girls. But you can't have this while holding on to that. You can't wear the new shoes unless you take off the old shoes. You can't live in light unless you get rid of the dark. Like you can't have light and dark in the same room. And God says the same thing right now. Can't hold on to God and the world at the same time. So the question that I'm asking you, how blessable are you? Are you willing to pay the price of blessing or you just want the reward of it? Like God says, we say to God, God, give me this much blessing. And God says, sure, give me this much separation. 
where you say, no, God, this much separation. I want to be just like the world. I want to live like the rest of the world. And God says, this is the amount of blessing that you got. I want greatness in my relationship. God wants separation in terms of the purity in my relationship. I want greatness in my marriage. God wants greatness in terms of the prayerfulness of my marriage. I want greatness in my stock portfolio. God wants greatness in my giving and sacrificing for others. I want greatness in my job and my career. God wants separation in how you treat everybody else in your job and in your career. You see how it works? We want great. He wants separate. <clears throat> God has a great plan for each and every single one of us, not just Abraham, but the only way that we'll get there is by life of separation. And a life of separation isn't a great, big, public. Life of separation means when nobody's watching. Life of separation, you know what they say about Abraham. I told you that where he grew up was not the best place, okay? And even his family, the tradition tells us, had fallen into idol worship. That's what made Abraham so great. The tradition tells us that Abraham, when he was even a youngster, just a lad, was in his parents' house smashing idols when his parents weren't looking. Like as a kid, his parents had all these idols and Abraham would see one and smash it because he was faithful and he knew this was not the real deal and he was different than him, even than his own family. And God saw that, that little separation, that little separation which nobody else saw, not Abraham on the big stage, but Abraham in the room when the doors closed. David was a great shepherd, not because he was a great king over Israel. David was great when there was nobody watching and he had one little sheep and there was a bear that was attacking and he guarded that sheep with his life. So God said, who better to guard my people and shepherd my people than the one who gave his life for one little sheep? You prove your faithfulness in the small little things and in the being separate when nobody's watching and nobody's keeping score and nobody sees it except you. So in that life, that inner life, that private life. Are you separate? Or are you just like everybody else? That's our first lesson. Faith, blessing, greatness starts with separation. Now, question I asked a minute ago, and I said the answer doesn't matter, but let's answer. Question is, why did God need Abraham to leave in order to bless him? Like, why, why could God not have just blessed him where he was? Why does God tend to always make things difficult? Like, why didn't God just say, like, I'll bless you right here and you will work from the inside out? Like, why take him out of the bad place? Why not keep him in there so he can make a difference? The first thing is the answer doesn't matter because it's God, not me. But we can think about it. And I'll say just very simply, like just logic, Abraham's family, like I said, not leading him in the right direction, his environment not good, and God knew that this seed for it to flourish needed better soil. So logic says, agree with me with some head nods right now, logic says for Abraham to be great, he needed to be away from that bad environment. You agree with that statement? Makes sense, like it's logical. Do you think it made sense to Abraham when God called him to do it? Do you think Abraham understood it? Do you think Abraham understood it maybe five years later? Like five years later, when he's left the land, he still has no kids, no parents, He's basically going to die all by himself, and no one knows his name. You think Abraham got it then? Maybe 10 years later? 15 years later? You think Abraham ever got it the way we see it so clearly? Our second lesson that we learned from Abraham. God doesn't give reasons. He gives promises. God doesn't give reasons. When God gives a commandment, he doesn't give an explanation or a reason. What he gives is a promise. God didn't tell Abraham, do this, because then this, and then this might happen to you, and then this, and then that's why this. No, no, no. God said in verse one, get out of your land. And then in verse two, he says, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. You shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Did he give him a reason? Or did he give him a promise? Which is better, a reason or a promise? 
If I were going to ask you to do something hard, which would you rather, a reason or a promise? Let's say you got children, parents. You're teaching your kid how to brush his teeth. What do you give them, a reason or a promise? No, son, you know, you're two years old and, and, and you know, there's, there's, you know, cavities and there's, you know, tartar and, you know, the, 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 the dreaded gingivitis, okay, that if you don't, you know, the two minutes and the gingivitis, so that's why you should brush your teeth. Is that what parents do? What do we do? Brush your teeth and I give you a cookie. <laughs> brush your teeth and I take you to the zoo. If you were to try to explain to a three-year-old the, 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 the decay and the gingivitis, what would they say? I like gingerbread, so I mean, they'll take some gingivitis. Like, why, why? They wouldn't get it. They couldn't understand those things. So the reason means nothing. The reason means nothing. Like, give it to me, I'll take, let's go to the zoo. I'll take the promise. I'll take, give me the cookie. That's how we treat our children, and that's how God treats us. We want to discuss. No, God, why? God tells us what to do, and we say, okay, God, have a seat. Present to me your case and I will approve or disapprove. God doesn't discuss. God doesn't explain himself to me. Like God explains himself to me. Like I report to my three-year-old child and I have to explain, well, this is why I bought this toothpaste and forgive me, what? What do you think Abraham would have done if God said to him, Abraham, I want you to leave your land. And Abraham said, why? And God said, well, here's what's gonna happen. You're gonna leave your land. And you're gonna have some really miserable times. And then you're gonna wait probably about 50 years where you actually have a child, all right? And then I told you you're gonna be like the father of nations, but you really are gonna have one. And then you know what I'm gonna do with that one? I'm gonna give you that child. And then like, nope, just kidding. I'm gonna make you kill him. And then like, no, just kidding again. I'm gonna actually give him back to you. What do you think Abraham would have said? Let's go. Recently, something happened in the Mesa household, which I still don't understand how it happened. Still don't quite understand how it happened. Two weeks ago, something invaded the Mesa household, my household, this thing. <laughs> Meet the newest member of the Mesa family. We adopted Dulce two weeks ago. Now those, who are laughing and shaking their head incredulously are doing so they know that I hate dogs. This is a dog, in case you didn't know. I hate dogs. And on top of that, my wife hates dogs. But somehow, I guess we have very persuasive children. That's the only thing I can come to the conclusion. I'm the guy, you know this, if you have a dog and I visited you. I'm the guy, I ring the doorbell, the dog barks, and I'm like, I jump. And I'm the guy that you have to lock your dog away when I go visit. In fact, actually, we got this dog on a Friday. On Sunday, I went to visit someone. On Sunday, I went to visit someone, and he had a little dog like this big. And I went in, and things started barking, and I jumped. He's like, you don't like dogs? I'm like, well, actually, I have one, but no, I don't like them, but I have one somehow. <laughs> one of the things about the dog that I learned, we had the training lady to come over and train us. Okay, and the dog apparently doesn't need training because she's good, but we need the training because she's like, you guys need more than the dog. So one of the things that I didn't see eye to eye with her on was about the role of negative consequences for a dog. She said, you can't give negative consequences, you can only do positive. And I'm like, but I, just one second. So if the dog does something bad, I have to let him know that he did something bad. She's like, no, it doesn't work that way. You only give positive when he does good. And I'm like, one more time. <laughs> so the dog poops in the family room. I would like to explain to that dog why that's gross and why that's not appropriate behavior and why he should never ever do that ever again. And I would like to give a consequence. She's like, no, you can't do that. I would like to explain to the dog why jumping into my bed is not appropriate because I am a person and the dog is not a person. We have dog bed for dog people, adult bed for adult people. Can't do that. I would like, most of all, to explain to her that her doggy food, which looks just like Cocoa Puffs as far as I'm concerned, which is very dangerous, okay, because I love Cocoa Puffs. So be careful in my house, okay? That her dog food, which is just like Cocoa Puffs, that eating it is good for her, and that eating the stuff that we, she wants to eat, which is our food, 
leads to the poo that's very mushy and yucky and leaves like little things. Yeah, exactly. But she said, no, you can't tell her any of those things. She won't understand. If she does the good, you give her the treat and that's it. Now, let me ask you a question. There's me. Me. <laughs> and then there's my dog. Okay. And there's a difference in understanding between me and my dog. What do you think is greater? The difference between me and my dog or God and me? Which do you think is a greater difference? The difference between us and our dogs or between God and us? And before I give you the answer, let me tell you this. I just told you that my dog eats the same food that I eat. And my dog lives in the same house. And when we leave her unattended, she sleeps in the same bed. What's a greater discrepancy in understanding? Me and the dog? Live on the same planet, same house, eat the same food? Understand the same commands, speak the same language? Or between man and God? God doesn't give reasons, God gives promises. There's a famous story in Matthew chapter 19 of the rich young ruler, a man who came to Jesus and said, Jesus, I want to follow you, and I want to be great, and I want a great inheritance, and I want a great reward from you. And Jesus said to him this, Matthew 19, 21, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. And the man, we don't know this, we know that he didn't listen to Jesus, we, he went away sad, he didn't do what Jesus asked him, the man thought to himself, why? Why do I need to sell what I have to be perfect? Why? Like, why should I? What does selling my watch have to do with treasure in heaven? Why, God? And Jesus didn't answer. And why, Jesus, do I need to forgive somebody who hurt me so badly? Like, what difference does that make to you? And why is fasting such a big deal? Like, who cares if there's meat or veggie burger, like who cares? God doesn't give reasons. God gives promises. And this sucker was given the promise of a lifetime, but because he didn't see the reason, he walked away. And he walked away saying, there's this guy back there, Jesus. He's really full of himself. He thinks he's the biggest know-it-all. I asked him all these questions, he didn't have any answers. He just started commanding all these crazy things. Then he couldn't give me one good reason to do it. I get afraid that we do the same thing. Time for fasting. Why should I fast? Giving is important. What difference does it make to God if I give? Hey, you need to pray. Why I prayed before makes no difference. Give me a reason. Give me a reason. Give me an explanation. Why should I? We look at the commands of God and we ask, why should I? I think instead, we ought to look at the promise of God and say, how can I? We look at the command and say, why should I? And instead, we ought to look at the promise and say, how can I? If you wanna be perfect, go sell what you have, give to the poor and come follow me, you have treasure in heaven. There's two halves to that. You focus on, why should I give everything I have? Why should I sell? Why should I follow? We look at the other side. You will have treasure in heaven. How can I? How can I have treasure in heaven? How can I have that? Faith is focusing on the promises of God, less on the reasons of God. Faith is focusing on the giver of the command, not the command of the giver. Faith isn't looking for explanations or reasons behind. Faith is happy with the treat or the trip to the zoo, and says, I don't know why brushing my teeth makes a difference, but I know every time I do it, I get a trip to the zoo or a cookie in my mouth, so I'm gonna keep on doing it. Let's recap our first two lessons, and then we'll wrap up with the last one. The first lesson was that a life of faith, life of blessing, life of greatness, begins with the step of separation. Your blessability will never be greater than your separation from this world. Number two is that God doesn't give reasons, God gives promises. And we need to stop asking why and how come an explanation 
And we need to instead focus on the promise and say thank you for the treat and trust. Now the last lesson, which is this is the one that you wanted from the start. We had to walk through the other two. The last lesson is this, life of faith. The reward always outweighs the cost, but it never precedes it. The reward always outweighs the cost, but it never precedes it. Abraham is blessed beyond belief, and we'll get into that starting next week. But I want to say it's not Abraham, it's us. God wants to bless us beyond belief. God wants my marriage to be the most blessed marriage. God wants my home to be the most blessed home. God wants me and me and me and me to be great like Abraham, like Moses, like David. God wants me and you to be great. But first is the cost. There's a cost to everything in life. There's a cost to being a doctor, medical school. There's a cost to being a lawyer, lawyer school. There's a cost to being a priest, the outfit, okay? It's hot, okay? There's a cost to everything. Life of faith has a great benefit, a great reward, which you will never, ever compare to the cost. It always outweighs it, but it never precedes it. Like I said earlier, you want life? First comes death. You want blessed? First comes separation. You want to be first? First you must be last, servant of all. I love this verse from 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9. It says, The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. That's a good memory verse if you're looking for. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro. And I love the term run because run, when this says run, think not like light jog, not brisk walk, not like the power, whatever, walking. Think of God's eyes running. Think of like miss the bus running. Like late for the flight, the gate's about to close in two minutes running. Think of that kind of running. Like the dog got off the leash and is running down the street. That kind of running down the street. That's the eyes of God are running to and fro, running, running, running to find one person who is willing to be separate. One person who's not looking for reasons, but is willing to trust in promises. One person who wants to be great. And on that person, man, sky's the limit. F.B. Meyer in his book on Abraham says that faith is the link with omnipotence. Faith is the link with omnipotence. Because when there's faith, it opens to a new plane. Like here's the world. Here's how the world operates. But the one who has faith, the one who trusts, the one who's willing to pay the price to be separate, to not look for explanation, but trust in the promise. That one doesn't live here. He lives here. And on this plane, the plane of faith, all bets off. All the rules go out the window. So the rules of biology and physics don't apply to Abraham because he's living up here. And the rules of what's supposed to happen with a 100-year-old man and a 90-year-old woman and what's never supposed to happen, that stuff goes out the window because you're living in the, faith of pl the plane of faith. Sky's the limit to the one who God sees his heart is loyal. The challenge for us, and this is perfect at the start of Lent, the challenge for us, we want to be blessed. God wants us to be separate. I'm gonna focus on my part, and let God do his part. The challenge for this Lent is who here, not says I wanna be great, but who here is willing to be separate? Separate in the way they deal with one another. Separate in their prayer life. Separate in their purity. Separate in the way they spend their time, the way they spend their money. Separate in their relationships. Separate in the way they handle success or failure at work. Separate in their thought life. Separate in their internet searching. Separate in the way they treat their parents. Separate in the way they deal with their enemies. Who is the one who's willing to be separate? And that one is the one who God will never stop to bless and pour abundance upon abundance upon that person. A wise person once told me, we're gonna study faith here for the next few weeks. And if you're in a life group, we're gonna talk about it more there. But a wise person told me this, faith can't be taught in a church. Faith can't be taught in a church. Faith must be practiced. It's kind of like 
Learning about a diet, learning the rules of diet doesn't make you any thinner. It has to be practiced. So we're going to learn about it here. And we're going to talk about it. And we're going to discuss it. But please don't think that anyone grew in faith today. We heard about it. We looked at it. But then the question is, we walk out those doors. That's the challenge that's in front of us. My prayers for all of us that like Abraham, we would grow in faith and our trust in God and our surrender to God and God would pour himself so abundantly upon us that we would never, ever, ever look back and say, cost, what cost? We would always see that the cost was nothing compared to the blessing. The reward always outweighs, but it never precedes. And my hope and my prayer during this Lent is that we experience that ourselves. Let's stand together for a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the great example of Abraham that you've given to us and you've preserved in your scriptures so that we can see it and be inspired. Lord, we know that, that the, the blessing which you gave to Abraham is, is not like exclusive to him and only him, but something that you want to pour upon all of us. So I pray that you would help me and you'd help every single person who's standing here today to take a step of faith during this Lent. Not a big one, not a public one, like a small step of separation, a step towards you and away from this world. And we know, Lord, we trust a thousand percent that that small step, that when you see our faithfulness in small, you will make us rulers over much. We thank you, Lord, for everything that you've done for us, Lord, and we're excited for what we know you're going to do during this study and during this Lent. We pray these things in the name of your Son, with the intercessions of all your saints, hear us as we pray thankfully. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.